really delighted to be part of the York Circle. It uh, really seems to be a wonderful event, and I too am a York alumnus, so I think I'm going to be paying more attention to those emails that come by and take advantage of these uh, lectures. I'm also really impressed uh, at the full room, given that it's going to be the most beautiful day. But I was looking at the rise in temperature, and it's going to peak just uh, after we're finished with today's event. So I think we'll all, we'll all be able to take advantage of it. OK. So uh, my talk title today is a bit of a mouthful. Um, but I really, uh, as Wade said, what I want to talk about today is some neurological patient work that I've been doing in my lab for the past 15 years and um, some newer brain stimulation work that we're doing as well in healthy individuals. So the sort of fundamental question that um, we could ask is, how do we know which parts of the brain do what? And this is uh, really known as the field of localization of brain function, localizing where different parts of the brain do different types of computational processing. And this field is a very old field. And one of the important early players in the field was uh, Franz Joseph Gall. And this is in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. And he um, started a field called phrenology. And in the field of phrenology, he measured uh, bumps on people's heads and said that you know, a, a bump here was related to uh, a certain type of cognitive behavior or personality type. So um, that was really an early attempt to localize brain function, and it's completely wrong. But it's, uh, <laughs> it was a start. <laughs> um, then in the early 1800s, mid-1800s, we had two people, Paul Broca. And Broca uh, found a patient, patient Tan, who could only say Tan. And uh, so this indicated that something was wrong. She couldn't speak. And it turned out that she had a lesion sort of in this part of the left hemisphere. And um, so Paul Broca realized that if you've got a lesion there, that probably is related to being able to speak. And Carl Wernicke, as well, uh, found another region that um, helped, uh, is, is also involved in language processing. Then we had uh, the case of Phineas Gage, sort of around the same time. And this is kind of a tragic case of Phineas Gage was working, uh, I think, in, the, in Vermont as a railway worker. And um, I think they have to set explosives so that they can lay the tracks. And unfortunately, one of these metal rods ended up going through his brain, through his head. But he survived. Here he is actually holding the metal rod. And here's a simulation of the part of his brain that actually got damaged, and it was towards the front of his head. And after this rod went through his head, his personality changed drastically. <laughs> Which, you know, seems to be an understatement. He was impulsive. And so we now know that the front of the brain controls behaviors like that. You know, being impulsive, having uh, difficulty inhibiting behaviors. And so a very uh, radical case, but one that really uh, directs us towards understanding brain function. Uh, I'm jumping ahead a number of years. Now we have uh, Dr. Wilder Penfield at the Montreal Neurological Institute. And uh, so he was involved in working with patients who are suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy. And I'm going to just play you a little video if I can sort this out um, here. Oh. Okay. So, so, toast is burning. Toast is not. Every time she has a seizure, she smells something burning. Now, if we can provoke that smell by probing the surface of the brain, we'll find the source of the seizures. Mrs. Gold, do you feel anything? I can see the most wonderful lights. 
And now what do you feel? Did you pour cold water on my hand, Dr. Penfield? Now what? Uh, what is it, Mrs. Gold? Burnt toast. Dr. Penfield, I can smell burnt toast. Dr. Wilder Penfield. He cured my seizures and hundreds more. They say he drew the roadmap of the human brain. We just called him the greatest Canadian alive. So this is uh, one of those heritage videos that ran on TV. Yeah, many people. Yeah, but oh, they're still on? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't have TV anymore, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, so let me see if I can. Okay. So his work really uh, was seminal as well in figuring out uh, that, that we could actually probe the brain and see what parts of the brain do what, and in particular with these temporal lobe patients and uh, and the I smell burnt toast is, is the, the patient that really uh, led that work. So I'm going to move beyond the history to what I'm doing today in my laboratory. And what I study is how we recognize objects, faces, and scenes. And I've got uh, two different approaches. One is this uh, patient-based approach where I study patients who have real lesions uh, in their brain due to disease or um, accidents. And then uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the virtual lesions that we do in my lab with transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. And the goal of that is to try and parallel the patient research to induce a transient virtual lesion. It's not really a lesion, but it's a neural disruption similar to the patient. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with scene processing. <laughs> And I'd like to tell you about the patient uh, after whom most of the research that I've been doing is based and that I'm going to tell you about today. And her name is patient DF. And she had carbon monoxide poisoning in her early 30s. She uh, lives in Italy and there was a uh, problem with the water heater and carbon monoxide built up, but luckily her husband found her in time. And, um, at the time, her MRI showed damage in sort of the sides of the brain and the bottom of the brain, but the primary visual cortex, the early part of visual processing at the back of the head, was spared. And when she was tested clinically, she had normal acuity, so it looked like she could still see well. She had normal color discrimination, so she can distinguish all the colors in the world. But the primary presentation was that she can't recognize objects on the basis of their shape. This is called visual form agnosia or object agnosia. So what does that mean if you can't recognize uh, an object based on, their, on its shape? So when she's shown uh, an orientation search task where we have to uh, look at these two different panels and say which panel contains something with a different shape, with oriented lines, she's unable to distinguish between those two panels. Now, as I said, she has spared color vision, so she can dis differentiate between these two panels here because there are circles that are green uh, that pop out against the red ones. Okay, so you might say, well, maybe she just doesn't <coughs> understand what shapes are. She doesn't know what they are. So when she was given uh, these two line drawings to copy, this is what she produced. So looking at these images, you can see an apple should have some roundedness to it, and there's nothing like that here. This uh, book looks like she's picking up on some, a, bit, a bit of the texture of the words on the page, but the shape is not a book. So then you might say, well, maybe she just doesn't understand. So when she's asked to draw from memory, close your eyes and draw from memory, she can draw an open book and an apple. So it's not an issue of not understanding what these images are. It's an issue of looking at something visually, only with visual information, and not being able to say what it is. OK. And when she's shown a real object in real life, She's a bright woman and she can see the red. It's made out of metal. And, and she suggests, is it aluminum? I can see the red plastic on it. And then she makes an educated guess and says, well, maybe is it some sort of kitchen utensil? 
that might make sense. So she's a, a, an intelligent woman. There's no IQ deficit here. Okay, so what's going on in patient DF's brain, you might ask? We have an MRI facility here on campus. It's actually just uh, over in that direction called the York MRI facility, and, and it's housed in the Sherman Health Science Research Center. And it's a uh, research MRI facility. We have all kinds of scientists doing research. We have some industry users who are developing medical devices who are also using the facility. And uh, so this is a picture of the building that you may see when you go back to your car. And this is the um, high field MRI magnet. So the MRI is magnetic resonance imaging and you can take pictures of your body. And here is a picture of someone going in to have their brain scanned in this MRI facility. Okay, so patient DF's brain. So this is a 3D rendering of her brain. This is her right hemisphere. And I've colored in this sort of silvery blue color, her lesion. So she's got a lesion. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. So her lesion is sort of in behind her ear. And then when we look at the left side of her brain, we see a similar thing. There, again, another lesion here in behind the ear. Um, and she's got a little bit of a lesion. This is looking at the, from the back of the head, and she's got another lesion up here in the parietal region. And this is looking, uh, taking the brain and flipping it over, looking at it from the underside. And so you can see bilaterally, she's got these lesions here in uh, this region called lateral occipital cortex. Okay, so what does lateral occipital cortex do? Well, um, this is some work that was done by a colleague of mine who put indivi healthy individuals into the magnet and he showed them uh, grayscale images of objects, line drawings of objects, and scrambled versions of objects. And he found that this part of the brain lights up for objects. So this is where a lot of the processing for visually recognizing objects is happening. And here is patient DF's brain, and you can see the lesion is in this LO region. And when we look through a slice of her brain, you can see that there are some dark spots here, which means that the um, cortical tissue is missing. So it's not surprising that she's unable to recognize objects, given that in both hemispheres, she's missing this object processing part of the brain. OK, so I'm going to move on to some of my uh, research that I have uh, done with patient DF. And I'm going to first raise a question about how we represent a scene. So how would we represent this lecture hall? How does our brain process this large landscape? And the question that I'm asking is, do we need to see the trees in, need, in order to see the forest? Do you need to see the local elements in order to perceive the global picture? OK, so you could imagine that one way that it might happen would be to recognize all of the individual objects and elements within a scene and then build up a global representation of the scene. It could be a bottom-up fashion. OK, so I asked, are these two processes, object processing and scene processing, part of a continuum? Or are they separate? Do you need to take in visual information about objects and then build up a scene representation? And how would you go about studying this? An excellent way to do this is with patient DF, because she cannot recognize objects. And this would tell us whether or not they're separate or if you need to have object processing intact in order to recognize a scene that contains a whole bunch of objects. And uh, so patient DF is perfect for this, since this object processing module in the brain is knocked out. So the first question that I asked with her is, can she recognize scenes? And then I thought, I remembered that she had that spared color processing. So maybe if she's recognizing scenes, she's using color information. And if you think about scenes in the world, natural scenes actually have very predictive color information. So a coastal scene, a beach scene, has lots of blue. 
a desert scene has lots of brown, and a forest scene, you expect to see lots of green. On the other hand, man-made, non-natural scenes, we can paint a room or a building any color we want. So there's really not any color predictive information about what kind of scene category you have. So my expectation with patient DF was that she probably can do this if you don't need object processing in order to process scenes. And I expected that she might be using the color information for natural scenes where color is predictive of the category. And my expectation would be that she might have a hard time with these color inverted versions that I made, where I took all of the color hues and I inverted them on the color wheel so that uh, green became purple. And you can see that this cityscape, when you invert the color wheel, it just looks like a smoggy day. OK, and so the, this is the data showing uh, the patient in pink and the control observers in uh, gray. And they simply had to say, what, is it a beach? Is it a city? Is it a market? And it's a really easy task. They're pretty much at ceiling. And you can see that patient DF really is just as good as controls. The minor thing is that her performance on the color inverted natural scenes wasn't as good. So she is using color information but she's just as good at contr as controls at categorizing scenes. So it looks like you don't need to have object representations in order to build scenes that contain objects. And another interesting thing is that she made a number of color specific errors. So when I inverted a desert scene and the, the brown uh, desert became blue, she would often say that it was a coastal scene. So you can see that she really is using color. And likewise, for an inverted coastal scene, looks like a desert. So she can recognize scenes, but uh, is using color information in some instances. And I asked, well, what about famous scenes? And I just showed her a bunch of random famous scenes. And she was very good at this, as good as controls, you can see. Around 65% controls were at 80%. OK, so what part of the brain codes scenes? It turns out that we have discrete regions in the brain that code, I've told you, objects already. We've got an, oh, my arrows aren't pointing correctly here. This is the object part of the brain. We have a uh, region bilaterally that codes scenes call in the parahippocampal gyrus which um, the uh, scientists, since we have such uh, strange jobs, we sometimes try to be funny, which is often poorly done with scientists, but it's called <laughs> the, the PPA, the parahippocampal place area, because it's in the parahippocampal gyrus. And then we have a region as well in the fusiform gyrus, which has been called the fusiform face area. So we have in, uh, so this is the underside of the brain. So front of the brain here, back of the brain here, we're looking underneath. So I'm showing you three different regions that are distinct in that they code these three different visual image categories separately. So does patient DF have brain activation for scenes? And when we look at her brain, here's the activation that you see in a control for scenes, and here's what you see for patient DF, and this is the PPA. So she's showing bilateral activation for scenes. It doesn't appear that her damage to the object part of her brain has affected neural activity in the scene part of her brain. So what I've shown you so far, just to summarize, is that patients with an inability to recognize objects, object agnosia, they can indeed recognize scenes. And I showed you that patient DF could even recognize famous scenes. And this suggests that scene perception can operate independently of object perception, and that we don't need to have a bottom-up representation from local to global, but you can have an independent representation of scenes. OK, so now I'm going to move on to the brain stimulation part of uh, my research in this area. And I asked the question, can we make a healthy person temporarily into a patient? In other words, can we induce a temporary lesion 
to a targeted part of the brain. And I call this a virtual lesion. And it's not really a lesion, because um, sound, that sounds awful, actually. Um, so here's the equipment that I have, and this is my brain stimulator. And here I am uh, applying brain stimulation to one of my uh, graduate students, but I, of course, also do it myself. Um, and so <laughs> I'll sh I'll sh I've got a video for you. <laughs> it's a non-invasive method to either excite or inhibit the brain, the underlying tissue in the brain. And what we do is we, uh, with this brain stimulation machine called transcranial magnetic stimulation, it's a magnetic stimulation, not a uh, current, not a direct current, that's a different type of stimulation. We um, take this coil here, put it on the surface of the scalp, and when you put a magnetic pulse on the surface of the scalp, it transiently disrupts the underlying brain activity. So it's very brief. It can be on the order of just milliseconds. Not permanent damage. OK, so I'm going to show you a video of TMS to my brain. Um, and I'm going to, my graduate student here is going to be applying TMS to my motor cortex. So it's the part of my brain that controls my hand. Um, specifically, she's stimulating my finger on my right hand right here. So uh, when I show you this video, I want you to look at my fingers. It's very subtle. I probably should have redone the video, so you need to pay close attention. And I'm actually going to just um, get out of PowerPoint because I was finding it was crashing when I embedded the video. But I'll uh, run the video here separately. OK. And I'll make it nice and big so that you can look at, so look at my fingers right here as they're twitching. When my graduate student uh, applies the magnetic pulse, it's going to make a ticking sound. And that's just the sound of the um, coil uh, producing the magnetic pulse. And uh, when it makes the ticking sound, my fingers will twitch. OK, that was it. Did everybody see that? Yeah. Are you aware that your hand is moving? Yes. Yes. <coughs> yeah, it, it feels kind of like, um, I was gonna, it's not like an electric shock, really, but you just sort of feel a twitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, sorry, I'll just go back to the. OK, so I like to show that video because um, I want you to know that I'm not just stimulating the brains of my graduate students, because that would be <laughs> unethical. But um, I always do stimulation. I always actually do all of the experiments myself. And the rule in my lab is I'm the first subject, because I should be the first one to undergo this, just in case anything goes wrong, which it won't. <laughs> OK, so the first question that we asked really followed from studying this patient DF who can't recognize objects. Can we disrupt object processing with TMS to the brain? And we're making a virtual patient DF. So we're targeting uh, brain areas for object processing with this transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And my question was, how is it going to affect scene processing? How is it going to affect object processing? And my prediction was based on the patient work Scene processing should remain intact, but object processing should be affected when you stimulate that part of the brain. OK, so I applied TMS to um, area LO, this cortical area that processes objects. And we um, first put people in the MRI machine and find out what part of the brain lights up for objects with functional MRI. That's where we look at both the structure and the function of the brain. Uh, then I have some really cool equipment in my lab that allows us to align that region of the brain with computers and with uh, the head in the laboratory so that when um, a person is receiving stimulation, we can precisely target that part of the brain. So that's called functional stereotaxy. And here are the data. Applying TMS to area LO, which processes objects. We had individuals do a really simple object categorization task where uh, they saw, saw objects, they saw 
uh, scenes, and they simply had to say, is it a natural object, like um, a head of lettuce, or is it something that's man-made? So it's the same question for scenes and for objects. And then we applied TMS when the uh, images came up on the screen, and we did the scenes and the objects in two different blocks. And here are the data. Okay, so I'm just showing you two of the conditions here. No TMS, and then TMS to object processing cortex. And this is showing our ability to correctly recognize the objects. And when we apply TMS to object cortex, you can see there's a reduction in your ability to uh, recognize objects. And this was the very first brain stimulation experiment that I did, and I thought, oh, thank goodness, it actually works. We're stimulating object cortex, and then it means they can't, can't do it. Uh, I mean, it's not that they couldn't do it at all. You can see it's a really easy task, but it's a subtle and statistical difference. The interesting thing was with scenes. Scene uh, recognition actually got better when object cortex was stimulated. So we can see that stimulating object cortex reduces object processing ability, but it increases your ability to recognize scenes. So they are indeed somewhat independent. OK, sorry, I thought I blotted out the other conditions. OK, um, so to summarize, this is consistent with the work that I had done with patient DF object processing and scene processing pathways may be uh, separate, but they're also, in this experimental situation, showing some kind of interaction. Manipulating one module in the brain actually has a, an effect on a, another object in the brain. And what it suggests is that there may actually be inhibitory connections between the pathways. It could be that objects are actually inhibiting processing of scenes but that once we knock out the objects, that releases the inhibition that may have been in place. Okay, so the next thing that we did in my lab was to say, well, what's happening in the brain when we do this brain stimulation? So we took my entire setup here and we rolled it down the hallway over in the Sherman Health Science Research Center into the magnet room. So you can see the MRI machine in the back of this picture here, and this is all of my brain stimulation equipment. And what we did was a paradigm called consecutive TMS and fMRI. So we perform uh, TMS to object cortex, and then we examine brain function with fMRI. And uh, the way we do it, we actually do about 15 to 20 minutes of brain stimulation, and then we run quickly into the magnet and take pictures of brain function. And we have to run quickly because, as I said, the effects of TMS are transient and they wear off. So you get your largest effect as soon as you've finished stimulating. And about you know, 20 or 30 minutes later, uh, all of the effects are gone. OK, so now we're looking at brain activation for objects. And here is a condition where we had no TMS. And here is TMS, TMS to object cortex. And now we're looking at the amount of activation within um, object processing cortex. How much signal is there uh, in the brain? And you can see that with no TMS, this is the control amount of signal. When we apply TMS, we see that the brain activation is going down as well. So that's consistent with the behavior. Then when we look at the scene regions of the brain, this is no TMS, and this is TMS to object cortex. And the green is showing you the baseline, no TMS amount of activation. And then this is the amount of activation when we stimulate object cortex. So it's increasing. And so this is really quite a nice finding in that we're showing that changes in brain signal actually mirror behavior. Which I guess actually now that I say it sounds pretty intuitive, but we weren't sure whether it would be that large of an effect that you would actually see it. And the effect is consistent with the behavior from patient DF who can't recognize objects but can recognize scenes. And we see that in scene processing cortex, it's still intact and functioning. Okay, so the last part of my talk, I want to ask about other types of objects. What about other types of objects? Are faces really just a specialized type of object? And the question that I asked with patient DF was whether or not she could recognize faces. 
And she's a great model because she can't recognize objects. Okay, so I'm going to tell you briefly about some work that I did with patient DF uh, on face processing, and then briefly uh, one TMS study that we've done with face processing. Okay, so the first question that I asked was can patient DF recognize a face? So what does it mean to recognize a face? I wanted to know whether she could say whose face it is. Can she recognize uh, the identity of a face? Can she recognize the emotional expression on a face? Can she discriminate the gender of a face? So I showed her famous faces, and she was unable to recognize face identity. And I showed her these are, you might think these are older, famous faces. I had to make sure that I showed her faces that would have been famous to her before her accident. She was unable to do it at all. And in fact, I even showed her my picture as I was sitting beside her. She couldn't recognize my face. Um, then I thought, well, okay, I'll show her some new faces and see if she can recognize them, uh, ones that she's just learned. And she couldn't do that. I showed her male, female faces. She couldn't discriminate between those, and that's a pretty easy task. Um, and then I showed her different emotional expressions. Sad, happy, couldn't do that either. But the interesting thing was that when I showed her uh, a whole bunch of different objects and faces, she couldn't recognize the objects. But she could say when the face images were shown to her that it was a face. So she could actually discriminate a face from an object, even though she doesn't know whose face it is, and even though she can't tell you what the objects are. She seems to know what a face is, the category of the face, but not whose it is. And this is called prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize faces. And you may have heard of this. Before, I know that it's um, had a lot of attention in the media in the last 10 or so years. So patient DF knows what a face is, but can't recognize a face. And the next question I asked was, does she have brain activation for faces? Because I showed you earlier that there is a module in the fusiform gyrus called the fusiform face area, or FFA. So um, does she have activation in the FFA? This is DF's brain. And you can see she's got bilateral, these um, pinkish regions are her activation for faces. So that seemed very odd to me, given that she can't recognize face identity, but she's got activation with, within the putative seat of face processing in the brain. And it's in all the intro textbooks now that the FFA is the region that codes faces. And here we have a patient who can't code a face, recognize a face, and she's got activation in this region. So I did a little bit more searching, and it turns out that there are a number of different regions that are actually within a network that respond to faces. And um, I'm pointing out two of them here, this FFA, the fusiform face area, and then there's another region called the occipital face area towards the back of the brain. So this is the back of the brain in a healthy individual, and this yellowish red here is showing you the part of the brain here that lights up for faces called the occipital face area. And here we have patient DF's brain. So uh, you can see that it's pretty clear that this lesion that she had has actually um, sort of goes into this occipital face area as well. So this work that we did with patient DF uh, showed that this occipital face area region is just as important as this fusiform face area uh, in recognizing faces. Okay, and then we did a TMS experiment uh, to see if we could mimic what's happening with this patient. She can't recognize face identity, but she can categorize faces. So here when we look at face recognition, so discriminating between different individuals, when we apply TMS to this occipital face area, uh, the ability to recognize faces goes down. When we apply TMS to this occipital face area and we just have to discriminate between a face and an object, it's unaffected. So it's consistent with the patient work. So TMS to the occipital face area disrupts face recognition but leaves face categorization intact. This is consistent with uh, the prosopagnosia patient DF who can categorize but not recognize a face. 
Okay, and so this is the last thing that I'm going to tell you about this morning. When you interact with patient DF, she does a really good job. She will know who I am whenever I go to see her. So how is she doing that? How does someone with prosopagnosia actually recognize people? Because you can imagine that it would be quite debilitating. Well, you can use a lot of other identity cues. Um, clothing is one way, and I know when we were testing patient DF, one of my uh, colleagues, you know, academics were always really good for our clothing, for our fashion, sense of fashion, and one of my colleagues wore a striped shirt every single day. And so she knew that this blue stripe was him. Um, and you could maybe recognize someone based on their hair, if their hairstyle doesn't change too often. Uh, gait is a really good way. Think about when you see someone from far away and they're walking towards you and you can't quite see their face, but you recognize the way that they're walking. So gait is often a good way. And another way is the voice. When someone says hello to you, you don't quite recognize them, but when they say hello, um, you're able to confirm that it's who you think it is. Okay. So uh, we did an experiment with, um, actually with a different patient who couldn't recognize faces, and we looked at person and object identity recognition. Um, so we had people learning uh, faces and listening to voices, and then we had as a control uh, objects, and so my graduate student and I were thinking, what objects make sounds? And so we racked our brains and came up with cars and car horns, that certain cars have distinct horn sounds. And so we trained people on learning these faces and, and voices and learning cars and car horns. And I'll show you the data. So we were testing a different patient named SB. And he has both prosopagnosia and object agnosia. Can't recognize objects or faces. And so this is uh, the person identity recognition based on the visual information of the face. So controls do really well. It's an easy task, pretty easy. Here's the, the patient, can't do it at all. Here, for, here are the objects, the cars. Again, controls and uh, can do this very well on the right. And here is the patient, can barely uh, recognize the cars. Now here's the auditory information. So we have um, controls on the right here, recognizing people based on their voice. Not as good as the patient. The patient does much better. And, um, sorry, and here we are with the objects, uh, car horn sounds, and uh, it wasn't a significant difference, but you can see that the patient was a bit better. So we were definitely seeing superior voice recognition. So here we have a patient who can't use visual information, but who is able to use another sensory system, the auditory system, in order to navigate the world, interact with people, and recognize uh, person identity. So we see accommodation for sensory loss. Patients naturally uh, may use other sensory information when they're suffering from sensory loss. And we could um, harness this to help individuals with rehabilitation with sensory loss. OK, so to conclude, what I've shown you this morning is that studying patients can reveal dissociations in the brain that may not be easily observed in a healthy, intact individual. We've seen some adaptive plasticity to accommodate for sensory loss using other sensory systems. In my specific research, we've been looking at coding of objects and faces and scenes, and we've seen that we have discrete modules in the brain for these, but also how they interact somewhat. And I've also shown you that transcranial magnetic stimulation of the brain can be a useful tool for probing functional connectivity in the cortex. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my graduate students over the years and every funding agency that has funded my research as well. Thank you.